welcome everyone. We are delighted to have you here. I, before we uh, begin with the introduction, I do have a, an announcement to make. Um, because last week we announced that Howard Lupovich's uh, lecture at Hill Day School, uh, which we hope you'll go to, was uh, scheduled for March 25th, and it was, but it has been changed to Wednesday, April 29th. So don't show up at the Hill Day School on March 25th. It will be April 29th on a Wednesday at Hill Day School instead. Uh, not right. And many of us will be in Israel and, uh, right. So we're good. Um, yeah, we'll, take it. We'll, watch it, we'll watch it on live streaming from uh, Tel Aviv. So I'm very um, proud and happy to introduce our speaker, and you'll hear why in a moment. Uh, Yael Aronoff is the Michael and Elaine Serling and Friends Chair of Israel Studies, who are wonderful friends, and Associate Professor at James Madison College, which you might know is at the great Michigan State University, where my son is studying right now. Not politics at all, but um, nonetheless, studying. I, well, I think he's studying. Um, <laughs> He's he is attending. I'm pretty sure he's attending. Um, she received her PhD in political science from Columbia University. She had her master's also, but um, I, I really can end the introduction right here because she got her uh, AB, we call it, uh, actually, at Princeton University, the greatest university in America, according to all of the polls and your rabbi. Um, there's lots of other things, but I just have to say, and I, we don't have time for them, I do want to say one thing, because her, her book, and you may want to get a copy of this, is called The Political Psychology of Israeli Prime Ministers. And given, <laughs> given what's been going on the last week, I'm thinking, I can't wait to hear what she has to say. Schizophrenia, multiple personality disorder, uh, there, there, will be, there will be a two-party uh, state, or there won't be one, I, I don't know. So um, I'm so confused. So I can't wait to hear what she has to say. The timing certainly is very good for her to address us. And with that, let me welcome you. Uh, Professor, we're so happy that you can be here with us. So great uh, to be back here. I think I've been uh, uh, here a couple times over the past few years, and it's such a beautiful uh, synagogue and a wonderful kind of dynamic place. So it's always nice uh, to be here. It was nice to see some friendly faces in the audience, and I look, really look forward to our uh, discussion. I think we have an hour and a half, so maybe I'll try to talk about half the time and then um, have half the time for questions and discussion because there's so much to talk about. We didn't know when we originally planned it that this would be the day after the Israeli election. So it's really, you know, a fantastic time, actually, because there's so many questions as to various coalitions, the implications of the elections, and there's so many different already, uh, just within hours, I think, interpretations um, of what the elections mean. So, uh, so of course, given the timing of this, I'm going to emphasize uh, the elections uh, and maybe how I would uh, interpret them. I'd love to get your feedback, and then we uh, can discuss it. Um, and then look at the possible implications, and I think they're varied possible outcomes in the future. I'll be stressing some potential uh, different scenarios for foreign policy implications. Um, that's often kind of what I focus on in my research and teaching, but also some domestic politics influence as well that may uh, come about from the elections. Maybe we'll talk a little about, about US-Israeli relations, Iran, all the hot things going on uh, in the last month or so. And so hopefully we'll have a really live lively uh, discussion. Uh, to start off with, I think what's uh, great is, as many of you saw, the voting turn I actually rose. It was uh, about a little over 72%, so higher than it's been in the past few years. Now, I think in the late 90s, uh, the turnout in Israel had always been almost up to 80%, which is incredible. So often, a lot of Israelis in this Israel Democracy Institute that I take MSU students to when I take them on study abroads, um, they're always fretting about lower voter turnouts and what does it mean and lack of trust in the government. But certainly in comparison to the voting rates in the United States, um, there is a very high engagement, uh, which I think is really positive among all Israelis, also among Palestinian Israelis in this election. There was a higher uh, voting turnout than it's been in the past few years. Um, and of course, we can all be proud that it's the uh, only uh, long-lasting democracy in the Middle East and amidst all the turmoil that it certainly um, 
is a strong democracy in many respects, and that's certainly something to be proud of. Now, how to interpret the elections, right, becomes interesting. Because you hear some people interpret it, right, as a dramatic shift in Israeli politics. Likud got more seats. Is this an uh, indication of a continued right which shift in Israeli politics and a strong shift in Israeli politics? So some people are claiming uh, those kinds of arguments with uh, dramatic possible impl implications. Some people even kind of, you know, kind of the, cop the apocalypse is coming kind of interpretations of the elections on one hand. On the other hand, some people argue that there's, you know, hardly much difference um, from what Israeli politics have looked like in the past few years. And I probably, as I tend to, probably uh, stand somewhere in the middle as to how I would interpret them. And I would you know, go through that with you and love to get kind of your questions and discussion later. So on one hand, I think the sense that this represents some kind of significant shift is more of a result, of course, of the expectations this week that maybe we'd have um, a different uh, coalition of parties and a different prime minister in the Knesset, of course, uh, uh, Her Herzog, and then uh, with Tsipi Livni in their uh, Zionist uh, Union Alliance. Um, certainly, even a couple weeks ago and a week ago, it seemed like they were ahead in the polls uh, by three or so, so seats. So I think compared to the expectation that possible there might be a somewhat significant shift in Israeli politics and a new prime minister, that's where you get the sense that if Netanyahu stays in power, that that somehow represents represents a dramatic shift. On the other hand, of course, if you look at the right and left blocks in Israeli politics, then you don't really see much difference at all, really. And you don't see a dramatic shift, and you don't see necessarily a rightward shift, which is a really interesting to look at. And so what it more represents, as many of you know, is a very polar, polarized society and polity um, where you have these two kind of uh, center left and right uh, blocks um, that we've seen at least in the last three elections. But even um, my dad, uh, we were just talking about that we, with the rabbi that we went in our father's footsteps and he became a rabbi and I became an Israel studies academic. Um, but my father wrote a book on um, visions and divisions in Israel in the 1980s where he talks about polarization in Israeli politics. And of course this, under in some interpretations, has existed post-67 post for decades in different forms, right? And so one of the things we're witnessing is a highly polarized society in some respects, even though post-Second Intifada um, the analysis was that maybe that has been minimized somewhat, somewhat and you get the creation of center parties. So perhaps the polarization has been minimized post-Second Intifada, certainly part of the story as well. But you still have these formidable blocks. And if you look at those blocks from the elections two years ago in 2013, and the elections, was it yesterday? It already feels like eons ago was yesterday, right? Um, in Israel, you don't see much change in those blocks. And some people argue that even though Likud, of course, increased the seats and Netanyahu has gained kind of power in some respects through that, that actually, if anything, the left bloc gained relevant, uh, relative seats as opposed to the right block. So, Because what really seems to have happened, as many of you know who are following the news closely, right, is that Netanyahu in the past few days was a, was, didn't take votes from the center um, and wasn't appealing to the center, right, but was looking to take votes from uh, Habayit Ayudi, the Jewish home, and other parties, and even Yachad, which didn't actually get to the Knesset, right? The far right party didn't even uh, make the new um, threshold that you need, right? As many of you know, Israel, um, uh, for its entire existence and even until today, has one of the lowest voting thresholds in the world, right? It used to be about 1.5%. It and only one other country, I think, in the world had that. Then went up to 2%. And then the feeling was that Israeli uh, governments are uh, unstable. They never last the four years. Uh, Barack's government only lasted 18 months. And the sense was that maybe we need to strengthen the larger parties, get rid of some of the very small parties, to make the government more stable, right? So just for this election, the threshold was raised to 3.25% rather than 2%, which means you needed 
uh, uh, really at least four seats to even make it into the Knesset, right? And the far right part, or Yachad, wasn't able to do that, right? So what uh, Netanyahu did was appeal to his competitor parties on the right, or that were even to the right of him, so to speak, in the Bayit Ayudi by Bennett, the Jewish Home Party, and Yachad, and they ended up voting more for Likud, right? Because he made a reasonable appeal to them that if you don't vote for me, you might not get a right prime minister at all, and then you're even less likely to get your agenda accomplished, right? So that, you know, so basically, you could argue that he consolidated his power, right, within the right, but he didn't necessarily increase the amount of people who were voting for the right block, right? Whether it's by uh, the Jewish home, whether it's Israel Betenu, which was traditionally a Russian-based, Avigdor Lieberman's party, um, whether it's some of the ultra-Orthodox parties like Shaz or United Torah Judaism, right? In addition to Likud. That's what we're talking about, of course, with the right block. They actually, that block, uh, arguably lost four seats from the elections in 2013. It seems like, depending on how you define the center parties, that they maybe uh, uh, have the same amount of seats as they had in 2013, right? Because then in 2013, it was um, the Kadima party, right? And it was the Labor Party, which together had about 21 seats. And today, it's the Labor Party and Hatnua party, which also together have about you know, the same amount of seats. Uh, I mean, the, the center party, Yeshatid and um, Hatnua have the same about uh, seats. And then if you look at the Labor, kind of coalition, they actually increased by four seats. So everyone who supports them is disappointed, of course, that they uh, ultimately lost um, to Netanyahu, but in fact, they increased their seats by four overall in terms of the left coalition, right? So it's very interesting that there are varied ways of interpreting the potential impact and what Israelis are thinking and where they're going. And I think it still represents a pretty polarized polity in society, like I was saying. And even what's interesting is in the, both last elections, as you know, even though traditionally um, most Israeli voters voted uh, primarily often on foreign policy issues, both in 2013 and yesterday, that wasn't the prime rationale uh, on which people voted. They often voted on economic issues, on disgruntlement with housing costs in the country and other things, right? That also came about from the social protest movements in 2011. So that was also common to the elections yesterday and in 2013, whereas in 2009, if you recall, uh, Tsipi Livni won the main uh, votes from the Kadima party, right? And her main priority in her campaign was urgently pursuing uh, peace negotiations with the Palestinian Authority, right? So she received the most votes in 2009, primarily on a platform dealing with foreign policy. And, and as we know, she wasn't able to cobble together a coalition in 2009, right? Because on one hand, she says, well, I have integrity, so I'm not going to give the ultra-Orthodox parties everything they want, the kitchen sink, and maybe I'm willing to give, I forget what it was, to Shah's 600 uh, million dollars, but not 900 million dollars, or something like that. She wasn't willing to give Shaz, that was one of the causes of her not being able to form a coalition, Shaz, what they wanted, and um, therefore wasn't able to form a coalition, and Netanyahu was able to in 2009, right? So certainly the prioritization of issues perhaps has changed uh, since 2009, but the relatively equal block between the two sides um, arguably hasn't changed all that much. And part of it was uh, perhaps Netanyahu's successful strategy in the past few days of appealing uh, to get votes from the right. And perhaps Herzog just wasn't as good at that in the past few days um, because arguably if he had appealed as successfully right, to the Yeshatid voters uh, by Yair Lapid, right, who ended up you know, getting less votes in getting 11 than in 2013, but still 11 votes, right? If he had gotten seven of those 11 votes from Yeshati, if people thought, oh, if we really want to get a different agenda, we have to strategize and I'm gonna ha strategize to have them vote for me, well, he could, he could have done, in a sense, what Netanyahu did, steal votes from other parties on the center, center left, and be able to, in a strategic way, then be the party 
that had the most votes, right? And so partially he wasn't as skillful as that. He's not as charismatic a person, right? Um, and part of it is, again, even though most people weren't um, voting primarily on foreign policy issues, he still is seen as someone who doesn't have as much foreign policy experience, doesn't have as much security experience, unlike someone like Yitzhak Rabin or Ehud Barak, who are decorated lifelong military people, and therefore uh, Netanyahu was also be able, be able to play that, you know, with a more recent emphasis on security threats to the country, um, especially in the past few days, right? So that's interesting to see. What we can talk about later, because I know it's a hot issue, is Netanyahu's speech in Congress and what role that played. And certainly, I think part of his intent was a genuine one, given his beliefs on Iran, but part of it certainly was um, um, a desire to increase his chances in the polls two weeks later, right, since he was four seats behind at the time. And if you look at polls in the couple days after he came back to Israel, it didn't seem to make any difference in that respect in, his poll, in the polls at that time, right? It didn't seem to, to help him, either because the people who were voting for him anyway you know, supported him on that, and then Herzog and Tzipi Livni were able to take advantage on the other side, saying perhaps you're threatening uh, the vital U.S.-Israeli relationship in some way, and they talked about that in their campaign, and it seemed on balance that he wasn't gaining seats in the immediate aftermath of the visit to Congress, but perhaps, you know, in the last few days, it still played a, a, some kind of role. Um, it, it'd be interesting to see and see more surveys on that. Uh, so I think then, you know, the question um, is, you know, what, you know, the main question is what are the implica possible implications of this, I think, and that's interesting to think about. And one of the possibilities, right, is that you're not going to see a situation that that's, that's that much different from what we've been witnessing in the last couple of years meaning the status quo will largely continue as it has. Um, uh, one might argue, right, on one hand, is it going to be a more rightward shift because you might not have the center parties like Yesh Atid um, in the coalition on one hand, right, might be one guess. On the other hand, one of the reasons he called for early elections two years in advance is to have greater bargaining power vis-a-vis -vis his coalition members, including parties on the right, and he successfully did that. So now the Baitayudi, the, um, the Israel Our Home party, has far fewer seats and has less bargaining power in trying to get what they want um, from Netanyahu on one hand, possibly, right? Um, so in that sense, right, there's less constraints on him from the right since he's empowered. And that might argue for some kind of continued status quo on one hand. Um, uh, you know, another thing that you, you, I mean, that would call for this is perhaps that you would have continued similar relations with Europe. Um, that Israel's neighboring countries are mostly, um, you know, absorbed with their own internal dynamics and issues and instabilities, and so they're not going to be turning uh, to Israel in any significant way. Um, that the U.S.-Israel relationship, despite the really bad friction right now between Netanyahu and Obama, um, is extremely strong, and so you're not going to see any significant changes in that relationship, right? Maybe it might be one possible possibility, right, that you have a strong re relationship, especially in the aftermath of the 67 war and the 73 war when Israel started having its special relationship with the United States. Um, and partially, as you know, this was a, um, uh, a factor of the strategic vet perceived value of Israel during the Cold War, where Israel proved itself against the Soviet clients in the 67 and 73 wars. In 7071, um, of course, Jordan, uh, the Jordanian Hashemite regime was threatened, right? A lot of the Palestinians and the PLO were in Jordan. They were threatening his regime. Syria was amassing tanks on Jordan's border to essentially help topple the regime, etc. at that time. And the U.S. asked Israel 
uh, to actually intervene on its behalf. It was absorbed in Vietnam, and it asked Israel as an ally to amass its tanks on the Jordan border and basically deter Syria from toppling the regime, which Israel successfully did, and the U.S. thanked Israel for afterward, right? So there, you could argue, began a special relationship, which is also based, of course, on common values and uh, c common sense of uh, democracy, uh, et cetera. And you, you are very aware of the dynamics that then were strengthened in the 90s. Um, were especially, you saw a special relationship between Clinton and Rabin, right? If you look at uh, Clinton, what he said, he had pictures of Rabin in his office, and he said he wasn't, um, Rabin wasn't his only favorite leader in the world, he was his favorite man in the world, uh, period. And of course, Israelis adored Clinton, right? He, he came to Rabin's funeral, Clinton said, Shalom Haver, goodbye friend, that was on the bumper sticker of a practically every Israeli car, um, and that maybe was one of the highlights, right, in terms of both both the relationship between the countries and the relationship between the leaders who also shared kind of somewhat similar ideologies, uh, et cetera, right? So, so certainly you could say it's strong enough uh, to withstand perhaps the per and it, I mean, I think it is uh, strong enough to withstand the personal friction between um, Obama and Netanyahu that the military aid and uh, support for Israel will continue, that is, uh, the favorability rate among U.S. citizens is about 74 percent, um, which is one of the highest favorability rates for any country in the world, and, you know, triple, quadruple the amount of other countries in the Middle East that the U.S. has and as of the Palestinian Authority. So on one hand, you know, given these dynamics, given Israel's um, you know, discovery of oil and uh, shale and gas, et cetera, um, that it now has a contract with Jordan to provide it to Jordan for 10 years and that it can ex start exporting these things, which can assist its economy. You might say, okay, one possibility, right, is that you have a continuation of the status quo. And even in some respects, things might get better, relations between India and Israel, right, India was one of the first uh, countries to congratulate Netanyahu, and things may continue the status quo or not necessarily uh, get much worse. And I'm usually an optimistic person, but I don't know if this is necessarily the most likely, you know, scenario, but certainly a strong possibility, right? Another possibility just to think through, right, would be that things actually get worse. You know, why? Um, well, uh, that now that Netanyahu this week kind of said, as the rabbi <laughs> indicated, um, that you wouldn't, he would, you would not see the establishment of a Palestinian state under his right um, rule as prime minister, and that the conditions were not right now for a Palestinian state because of the threat of uh, extremist Islamic terrorism and so forth, um, that therefore he is perceived as being against the two-state solution, uh, and there's gonna be really potentially negative repercussions of that for Israel, right? Now, on one hand, under this scenario, you know, I think that he's probably going to you know, move back, you know, from that position. He's smart enough and pragmatic enough to do that, to see the potential negative consequences. He did it partially in the two or three days before the election, thinking he was going to lose the election to gain those votes. He did it for politically strategic reasons, and therefore you will very quickly, and you already have to some extent, have him retract that position or qualify it that I definitely support two states. I was just saying that in the immediate conditions of a unity government with Hamas, which of course is why he um, uh, stopped the peace negotiations to begin with uh, last spring, that in the immediate conditions, you're not going to see a Palestinian state, which is not really that dramatically different from what I've said in the past, and um, you know, that he could get away with that, right? And partially, I'm not gonna, I have a chapter on Netanyahu. Um, I was pleased after like 10 years of research that it came out with Cambridge University Press this summer. If you wanna read more about the prime ministers at Netanyahu, I urge you uh, to buy it, not to be a saleswoman, but I get it at a 40% discount as an author and I sell it at that same 40% discount. For, so it's for $20 as opposed to $30 if you go on the web or to a bookstore. Anything, so if you wanna read more on Netanyahu. But to encapsulate a little bit in terms of 
the psychology of Netanyahu or the influences of Netanyahu. Part of, I think, understanding him is that on one hand, he is strongly influenced by the Likud ideology, of course, as many of you know, that has its roots in the revisionist movement, right? And so, uh, as you may know, his father had a huge influence on him. He died at age 100 a couple years ago. Uh, he would consult his father and show speeches to his father and so forth. His father um, was the personal assistant of Jabotinsky, right? Also, when he, uh, the forefather of the revisionist movement, right? That would be for retaining Judea and Samaria or the West Bank and Gaza, right? So ideologically opposed to a two-state solution. He was highly influenced by this ideology. He has books by Jabotinsky in his, uh, you know, office for years. Um, and so ideologically, of course, for most of his life, he's been vehemently against the establishment of a Palestinian state. I might say, as were labor leaders in the past, before the PLO changed its uh, goals of destruction of Israel and changed its tactics of using terror tactics in its 1988 proclamation and then leading to the 1993 Oslo Accords, right? So, okay, so many Israeli prime ministers start out with that position. But for him, it wasn't just kind of a security reason as it was for Rabin in Paris. It was an ideological reason based in the historical sovereignty of Israel uh, uh, a couple thousand years ago. And therefore, there was a historical reason why one shouldn't concede it and not just a security-based reason. And he was highly committed and is somewhat still committed to this ideology, right? So that's why he vehemently opposed the Oslo Accords, right? Uh, when the mutual recognition between Israel and the PLO when they were first signed. But then most Israelis supported it in the aftermath. It was popular in the aftermath. It was an era of hope uh, when Rabin uh, was still alive and in the immediate aftermath of his assassination. So he knew, according to polls, that in order to be elected, he would not be elected unless he said that he supported the Oslo Accords or that he would continue the commitments of the previous government. And that's what he did. And I don't think that he had some, you know, reborn experience overnight that made him change his views. But what I'm saying about Netanyahu is that he's partially heavily influenced by his ideology, but that partially he very much uh, is a politician who wants to attain power and is pragmatic enough, therefore, to sometimes make accommodations in his ideology to gain that power, right? So one instance was in order to get elected in 1996, he, he, he's saying that I now support uh, the Oslo process. And he said, of course, under the caveat that, um, that uh, there'll be reciprocity, and if they fulfill all their commitments and they're not fulfilling all their commitments, well, therefore I don't have to do as much many withdrawals, right? But then, surprisingly to many again, he signed the Y and Hevon Accords, right? Gave up some territory in the West Bank, which really upset his father and family members who are uh, to the right of him, and actually ended up breaking up his coalition in 1999, even though he never implemented the Y Accords. Uh, he ended up losing power, really, as a consequence of that. Right. So you see, in a sense, throughout his time that sometimes he'll make accommodations as a function of internal, external pressures because he's pragmatic and he thinks, well, um, I'm still maintaining most of what my ideology wants by making some uh, compromises and I'll still try to retain other things, right? And so that has been his, so in that sense, his changes are not surprising uh, to me because he's continuously trying to, on one hand, be true to his traditional ideology, but on the other hand, accommodating to the fact that most Israelis say they support a two-state solution and the international community supports a two-state solution. And therefore, in 2009, and for the past six years, he's been saying he supports a two-state solution. Right, so again, so my you know, sense is that he has undergone some degree of, let's say, a genuine shift on the issue. I think if you look at a lot of the things he says, he does, you know, on one hand, recognize the dangers of a binational state um, and has mentioned that. He does sometimes see the demographic trends where you can't just have a one-state uh, solution. Um, so he does recognize some of these things. He, I think, would be willing to make some uh, more and perhaps significant uh, concessions on the West Bank so that it's not all a ruse or something like that. On the other hand, 
he's very much pulled in the direction of his traditional uh, ideology based in revisionist roots. Um, he wouldn't contemplate dividing Jerusalem like Rabin and uh, like Barack and Ulmer did, um, which arguably uh, might be necessary to reach a peace agreement. And therefore, you see more waffling back and forth, right, in terms of these things, because I think he himself is pulled in different directions, where on one hand, he realizes uh, perhaps that things may be leading to one state solution. On the other hand, he has a very difficult time completely detaching himself from the ideology he's been committed to for his life. And as many of you know, even within Likud itself, there's a real split between those um, like Meridor, who already in the 80s started supporting a two-state solution, and then uh, left Likud and came back and left, and others within uh, the Likud party who do not support a two-state solution. So he's politically torn within his own party as well. Now, I also think there are a lot of kind of psychological issues. I don't want to, you know, I don't feel like I should talk another 10 minutes or so to give time for questions, but there are also psychological issues with um, Netanyahu, there's a bunch that I talk about, emotional uh, intelligence, cognitive rigidity, um, time orientation, he's very much focused on the past and making past uh, analogies uh, to the past, and I think that makes him less um, likely to expect, for instance, an adversary like the Palestinians to change their goals and le less likely to see ambiguity in that. He's very much thinks that the past will repeat itself, and that heightens his uh, threat perceptions. Um, and also, he's very risk averse, right? Um, so, you know, this plays into his interpretation of uh, 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 in all times, but especially when the region is going through such instability, it heightens his risk aversion that perhaps there would be too much risk in engaging in a full peace agreement, and therefore he um, sees no urgency to pursue one, and he thinks that time is on Israel's side, right? Versus somebody like Barack or Livni thinks that time is working against Israel, and therefore they urgently want to see a peace agreement. And even you have Barack talking about Israel being the Titanic that's going to hit an iceberg. You have him in the aftermath of the tsunami in uh, Japan saying we're gonna, Israel's gonna face a diplomatic tsunami. You have Livni saying it's urgent, right? So you have different perspectives in Israel focusing on whether time is for or against you is one of the elements and therefore having very different perspectives as to whether the instability in the region makes peace more urgent or whether someone like Netanyahu makes them even more cautious and even more risk averse, right? So there's so many things going on with him. The bottom line, right, with this scenario is that people stop believing Netanyahu, right? So that he can't come, he can't just retract what he said Right, because at this point, uh, the United States government isn't believing him, European governments aren't gonna believe in him. Now when people are already skeptical about what his real motives are, there's gonna be the sense of, you know, that's what his real motives are, um, and therefore uh, the Israeli government is not for negotiating peace, is not for a two-state solution, and that's pretty dangerous in, to some respect, or could have pretty negative results if that happens. I don't think, you know, everything's going to unravel tomorrow, but there certainly could be negative consequence and it wouldn't just be the status quo continuing. Um, and so some of those possibilities would be EU sanctions against Israel. Some of those possibilities would be, as the Obama administration has indicated in the last 24 hours, that they're going to be stop being as supportive to Israel in the UN, that they'll continue giving it military aid, but that if the UN decides in a resolution to try to impose a solution based on the 1967 borders, that the US is going to stop vetoing uh, these things in the UN. Um, and therefore, you're going to see a significant difference. You're going to see an increasing threat to Israeli legitimacy in the world. And you're going to have a real empowerment of the boycott divestment uh, movement that we see growing uh, on university campuses in the United States and elsewhere, where certainly it seems to me like it's spreading like wildfire from campus to campus in the United States with attempts at resolutions, attempts at a University of Michigan last spring. I spoke out against it there. 
Um, and uh, it's coming at some point probably to MSU. There were starting discussions about academic boycotts. It's going from campus to campus, not only among students, but among professors belonging to various academic organizations who are increasingly wanting to boycott Israeli scholars, um, Israeli academics, study abroad trips to Israel, etc. So this is bad news, right, either economically for Israel, diplomatically for Israel, and even though it doesn't threaten in the immediate term the very strong relationship between Israel and the United States, if you look at what, how students' uh, favorability rate on campuses is towards Israel, it's far less than the general national uh, generational trend, far less. So just as an anecdote, in my own classes, sometimes I have simulations of Israeli-Palestinian peace negotiations, and I often um, have students research and take on positions and simulations um, where they have to take on and research the party they're less sympathetic for, right? So if somebody, thinks Israel is awful, they have to try to understand Israel and represent it and research it. If somebody thinks the Palestinians um, are less sympathetic, they have to try to understand where they're coming from, et cetera, right? So in order to do this, I have them write down what they already know about it, where their empathies lie, et cetera. Now, last year, in some previous years when I did that, and somebody in my class at MSU, about a third, and this is James Madison College, it's more political than some of the other departments, so it might be different. But about a third of the students would be more empathetic to Israel, a third more empathetic to Palestine, and a third uh, neutral, right? This is very dramatically different from just national surveys, right? Now, after the war this summer, right, and um, I, I think uh, somewhat also problematic media portrayal of the war, which we can also talk about as well, that when I did it uh, in September, uh, it was much less than a third that was empathetic to Israel as a consequence of watching the media's coverage of the summer, right? So what I'm saying is even though there's no immediate threat, 20 years from now, these are gonna be people in Congress, these are gonna be people in the State Department and intelligence and everywhere influencing US follow, these are gonna be the voters, and certainly you, there's potential for a significant shift there that we need to be concerned about. Um, then there are even worse, you know, I'm, you won't believe that I'm usually optimistic, but there are even worse scenarios, right? If then the Palestinian Authority, which is what it's threatened in the last couple of months, um, if Netanyahu, if the belief is now, which will be capitalized on, that Netanyahu is against two states, right? Then there'll be increasing pressure on the PA to end its excellent security cooperation with Israel, which would be a, potentially a disaster, um, right? Because then again, you'll see more terrorism in Israel. It'll affect, uh, obviously, people's lives in Israel, their sense of security, the economy, tourism, uh, everything else, right? Um, you know, I don't think this is likely necessarily because the Palestinian Authority also has security cooperation with Israel for its own interests, right? Because uh, doing so also, um, you know, uh, pushes away the potential threat of Hamas to them and not just a political threat, but a violent threat that could be used against them, right? So cooperating with Israel in terms of intelligence also serves their own interests. But nevertheless, they could get so much pressure and they're already, you know, have been talking about it uh, relatively more seriously. That could be pretty bad. And then things could get worse in the region in terms of ISIS coming closer to the Syrian border, in terms of Hezbollah at some point capitalizing on the instability or uh, lack of security cooperation, et cetera, right? Things could certainly un unravel there. So, um, so, I mean, I think this point, so there's also a possibility, not a likelihood, but a possibility that Netanyahu, in one of these first or second scenarios, faces a changed situation, more a domestic and external international pressure, and a sufficiently pragmatic person to accommodate that and to take more serious steps. It's not necessarily possible, but uh, uh, um, likely, but it's certainly possible as well, right? He's not an ideologue uh, like Yitzhak Shamir was in the late 80s. So this points to the real necessity, I would think, as we all know, um, for Israel and the new government to really staunchly show that it is for two states, right? I don't know if you saw just uh, in the last few hours, early this morning, there was an op-ed in the New York Times by someone who's saying they were glad 
uh, that Netanyahu won again by a significant margin because it makes things clearer for the BDS movement that Israel is against two state and you need BDS, right? So there is a real need for so many reasons um, to come out for a two state solution. And on the optimistic side, um, there's so many reasons internationally and regionally that are actually, one could argue, amenable for that, right? I mean, here you have US, Israel, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Jordan, all who see Israel as a potential ally against Iranian in increasing influence, who some of these states face potential instability in their own countries and think it would make their lives easier to see an agreement. You have, therefore, lots of countries in the region and externally who would support uh, such an agreement, and we can talk about that if you'd like. Um, so there's also, of course, domestic implications that I didn't uh, you know, focus on as much in these particular elections. But as you know, in 2013, one of the changes was you had more, you, it was one of the first times in Israeli history, and I'll try to wrap this up soon, it was the first time in Israeli history where you didn't have religious parties in the coalition, right? Practically every Israeli government, because there are 10 parties in the Knesset, often as there are 10 to 12 parties in the Knesset, no party ever gets a majority, even Netanyahu, this time in 2013, got at most a third of the Israeli vote, really, right? Because it's so fractured among so many parties that people are voting. So almost every government included a religious party. 2013 was one of the first times uh, there were none, and there was a concerted effort upon Yesh Atid and Bennett from the um, Bait AUD to kind of get ultra-Orthodox to serve in the military, um, to look at some of their subsidies, to perhaps break some of their monopoly on some religious issues. Um, some progress was, on, was made on that, <coughs> on that front. But the likely scenario for Netanyahu is that he's going to need some of those religious parties and will probably get some of those religious parties in his government. Right? So the implications of that are that some of that thrust um, of the secular uh, center in 2013 is uh, going to be lost and there's going to be backtracks on that. Now potentially, even within his probable coalition, which will include Kulanu, which has 10 seats uh, Moshe, from Moshe Kalon, he used to work for Netanyahu, he used to be in the Likud, uh, Netanyahu wouldn't let him be finance minister in 2012, so he left the Likud, he formed his own party, he wants to redistribute, well his main agenda is to redistribute wealth to the middle class and lower middle class, right? Um, and he has a bunch of other things we can talk about on his agenda. Now if you have him on one hand in the coalition, and on the other hand, these religious parties who want more subsidies for their schools, like Shah's and United Torah Judaism and others, uh, more um, sub subsidies for settlements, et cetera. There is potentially a conflict, right, between those right parties and his coalition when one's main agenda is the redistribution of wealth in various ways and another is wanting more money um, for the ultra-Orthodox and Orthodox, right? And so there's definitely going to be tension among those parties, which could mean Right, that you have elections again in two years and the coalition won't last, right? Because if he does, if he includes that coalition, it's probably 66 and it's not necessarily uh, going to be stable for four years, right? So you have those internal uh, battles uh, domestically. And then you have the whole issue, of course, of Palestinian Israelis and Jewish Israelis. Um, uh, and you have the potential in the new government for those tensions to increase um, because, as you know, because the Pal there were three dominantly Palestinian parties, right? Balad, the Communist Party, uh, the uh, Islamist Party, so to speak, um, and Hadash, the Communist Party that's mostly uh, Palestinian. For the first time, they're, as you can see by their names, they're so divergent on uh, their visions of what they want and priorities, but because they th were threatened in a new system of not making it to the Knesset, they formed an alliance and more Palestinians voted and they have a little few more votes in the Knesset. So on one hand, that if they don't get any of their demands, it could increase tension. And of course, as you know, Netanyahu in the last couple of days was saying that, you know, Jews better go out to vote because there's so many Arabs voting, um, which of course is problematic in terms of diminishing tensions between Palestinian and Jewish uh, Pal uh, Israelis. So you have potential for in increased tension. On the other hand, you have, they're now the third biggest alignment in the Israeli Knesset. Um, uh, 
um, the Israeli president is actually a Likud person, but who's very sensitive to diminishing tensions between uh, Palestinian Israelis and Jewish Israelis. Um, and so perhaps there might be some room, even in the present government, some, for some improvement in that direction. They also may be trying, as part of the, their agenda, to lessen the influence of the Supreme Court and the judicial review of the High Court in Israel and other such Thing. So we didn't even get to Iran and Netanyahu's visit um, and everything like that, which is very important. So we have plenty to talk about, but I want to leave uh, lots of time for questions. So at least hopefully give you some things to, to be thinking about. And I'd love to get your reactions, questions, comments, and we can have some good discussion. Yeah. Oh, I think hands down day and night, two-state solution is far better. Um, well, you know, one, the main uh, reason would be that I believe in self-determination for peoples. I believe in self you know, it's an international right that all peoples have. Jews have a right to it. Palestinians have a right to it. But Jews used to have it in Israel 2,000 years ago. They lost it. Um, and suffered a lot of persecution as a minority in different countries, culminating in genocide. Uh, the Zionist movement, I think, quite successfully and rightfully um, renewed uh, Jews' ability to exercise self-determination, which again is a right that all peoples have. They revived the Hebrew language. They established uh, culture. Um, they have uh, a free, thriving, dynamic, interesting, culture which they couldn't have as a minority someplace else. Somebody who describes us very nicely is Gadi Taub, who uh, was a visiting speaker we had at MSU this year, who's an Israeli historian and uh, screenwriter and novelist. But he talks about how his grandmother laid the bricks and some of the roads in Israel. But one of the first things she liked when she got there, she actually saw things in Hebrew on public things, even little things like that. Every culture has that right to be able to celebrate and nurture its culture in that way, much less stay alive. And so I think um, uh, it's established by the UN. It's been a UN member for over 67 years. And like other, every other nation uh, deserves the right to self-determination. Beside, besides whether someone thinks they deserve it or not, they have it. And they're not giving it up. 99% of Jewish Israelis will never you often say, I often tell my students, never say never, never say always. But 99% uh, but of Jewish Israelis, at least in this next 100 years or wherever, um, is not going to give up uh, its right to self-determination and threaten to be a minority, you know, be threatened to be a minority in 50 years' time or 30 years' time if it was in one state. A, if it became a minority, there would be absolutely no point in having Israel. It wouldn't be called Israel. Um, it wouldn't have necessarily Hebrew as an official language. And as you know, probably since Israel started, Arabic is also official language. Um, so there would be no point to what people died for and created and suffered for uh, in Israel over more than four generations, right? So they're not giving it up. It's their home. They were born there. Their fathers were born there. Their grandfathers were born there, many at this point. And they're not going to succumb to be a minority like they are in other countries on the world and like they are in France today. A, it's not happening. Whether you think it should happen or shouldn't happen, it's not happening. Jewish Israelis are not going to go for a one-state solution. What does that mean? That means that, to me, that when people call for a one-state solution, either among the Palestinian community or among the Jewish community, what you're really calling for is perpetual violence and bloody conflict. Because people are not willingly going to give up self-determination and being a majority. So what it's really called for, and many of my students talk about it, and it sounds so nice and idealistic, everybody will live together, and it will be wonderful, and it will be a plural society, and it will just be this utopia. Well, you might think that, but Jewish Israelis who live there don't think that, right? So therefore, you know, it's not happening. And the only way it would happen is in a very, very bloody way. So that's one thing. And secondly, even in some kind of theoretical sense, if it were to happen, if you look at one state solutions around the world among populations that have been in violent conflict with one another, 
it doesn't look so pretty, right? Whether it's Lebanon or other places, what you then turn it into often is a civil war, which we see all over, you know, all over the world and especially in the region. So what's more likely to happen than people all living and respecting each other nicely in a utopian world is a bloodbath. And certainly you're gonna have parts of Hamas and parts of Islamic Jihad that aren't necessarily gonna live and let live. You're gonna have someone, some Israelis on the extreme right who necessarily won't either. And it's not gonna be a happy utopia. It's gonna be more violent than it is now. And you're gonna have Jews in the same situation that were for the same, you know, for the last 2,000 years, which is not necessarily a wonderful one. So that's my, I have a strong opinion about that. <laughs> yeah, except for, they both exercise self-determination now, right? Right. Go ahead. When was this, by the way? Or? Uh huh. Well, Jordan controlled it, right? So, and Jordan, if we, if Israel crossed that fence to try to make it better, they'd be shot, right? So I don't think Israel was in a position, as much as I'm critical of Israeli policies, which if you know my politics, I'm highly critical of certain policies. I'm not an uncritical supporter of Israel. But it's, it's a fantasy world to think that Israelis could go over the 67 fence into, no, oh, I'm sorry. I, I'm so sorry if I misinterpret what you saying. Who's they? Oh, okay, I misunderstood you. Okay, oh, I misunderstood you. Right. Well, I mean, that's a good... That's a good question, right? right. right. Well, that's a good question. Well, certainly, of course, East Jerusalem itself has religious significance, right? For Muslims and especially for the Hashemite kingdom, they were supposed to be the descendants of Muhammad who would take heir of the right, and so as we know, uh, Hussein's grandfather was assassinated for even thinking about uh, cooperating with Israel, and Jordan is the one who funded and built the beautiful gold dome that you see. Um, so certainly there are religious and political issues of prestige for them as to why they would want to be the, um, the uh, caretakers of the mosques there, right? But besides the land itself, I mean, as someone who comes from a political science international relations background, it's power politics, right? People want to expand their influence, to expand their territory. And at that time, of course, in 48, uh, Syria and uh, Iraq and Egypt and Jordan, which attacked Israel, as we know, weren't attacking Israel in order to provide the territory for Palestinian state they were attacking Israel in order, in order to divide it amongst themselves, right? So it's pure power politics, not because it was valuable or wealthy at that point. Yeah, Jeff. It seems to me that demographic dictates that there has to be a state ruling over the It also seems to me that the, the Palestinian concept of the right of return and the uh, Israeli Well, I think, it's, I think it's certainly one of the biggest challenges, and that's where I know you belong to an optimist club, but that's where I, my optimism comes in, is that um, I respect, you know, I have deep respect for optim optimism, 
that basically it's not an insurmountable challenge. It's certainly a challenge. Why, why is it a challenge? Certainly you're right. And certainly one of the things that Ehud Barak came out, he of course was voted on in a huge mandate on a platform for urgently pursuing a peace agreement and reaching a peace agreement with the Palestinians as a protege of Rabin huge hopes, he got uh, a more, much more of a landslide than Netanyahu got yesterday, right, so Barak. And he thought, okay, I'm gonna test, uh, you know, uh, Arafat at Camp David, and this is one of the issues that, that, from which you speak that bothers him and certainly bothers Netanyahu. He thought Arafat would not give up the right of return of refugees, um, and therefore, you know, you couldn't really have a deal, right? And so certainly there's a lot of uh, room for concern there. The reason I'm optimistic about it is because essentially the Palestinian, uh, Abu Mazen, Mahmoud Abbas, the pre present Palestinian Authority president, who was the last leader to be elected, was it seven years ago or so, um, in his negotiations with Omer in 2008, was willing to give up the implementation, largely the implementation of the right of return. Um, and we have a thousand Palestinian documents that were leaked, it's called the Pali leaks, right, that were broadcast by Al Jazeera and that were written about in The Guardian. Um, he, they got in huge trouble over this, right? Because essentially what their position was, and it was the same, was that, okay, we have a right to return. But we realize, right, that Israel is never gonna go for all refugees being able to return. It would change the demography, et cetera, in terms of being a majority. We recognize that, therefore, we're gonna heavily restrict the implementation of return, meaning we're not gonna say that whatever three, four million potentially refugees can return, we're gonna say that we're asking for a couple hundred thousand refugees to return. Um, Barak, by the way, in the 2001 uh, peace negotiations was willing to have 40,000 return under the rubric of family reunification rather than right of return. Ehud Olmert in 2008 was willing to have about 15,000 refugees return under the rubric of family reunification. So really what we're talking there, it's much easier to see a solution there because what you're really talking then about numbers and not huge difference in numbers. We're talking about 200,000 versus 40,000. So maybe you agree on 100,000, whatever it is, right? That's, you can negotiate on as opposed to the principles. Now you still have the problem that the Palestinian Authority wanted to call it the right of return and Israel wanted to call it family unification, but you might find a caveat, uh, return, you know, rather than right of return. I mean, there are all kinds of creative language that could be used. Now, when it was leaked and, when, and there was no agreement, the Palestinian Authority got in trouble for this because it hasn't really educated its public to fully support a concession on this. Saeed Arakat, who you see in the news all the time, was one of the main Palestinian negotiators for 20 years, had to temporarily resign over this issue and then he came back. So it's certainly not something that's fully supported among the Palestinian community, but I very much think that the next time there is serious negotiations, the PA will um, continue to uh, be able to agree to a very small implementation of the right of return. And by the way, I'm giving these long-winded answers, by the way, this was inherent in Bill Clinton's idea of the Camp David, uh, of the Clinton formula that I think is gonna be the basis for any future agreement. And I think it's a brilliant idea. Be, the, ter the borders are relatively easy. Based on its 67, they were 3% apart in terms of the West Bank. Uh, in the last negotiations, they're very close to deciding on a border, that's easy. What's hard is Jerusalem and refugees. And I think Bill Clinton was, had a brilliant idea of having a trade-off between these issues, right? So that Israel, he says, as painful as it is, it is you're gonna to have to concede most of East Jerusalem. And he says, Palestinians, as painful as it is, you're gonna essentially have to concede refugees going back. And therefore, the, the implementation of the right of return will be heavily constrained. And that was the trade-off that both essentially accepted, more or less, in the serious negotiations in 2001 and 2008. So if we can get back to that, I think there's a lot of room for hope. Well, that's a good question. I mean, it, part of the reason in 2008, and that's in the, this is part of what Netanyahu says, look, you know, a great offer, and it's true, a pretty good offer, was given Mahmoud Abbas in 2008 by Olmert. They didn't take it, so they're not serious, right? Israelis think the Palestinians aren't serious, the Palestinians think Israelis aren't serious, right? So 
Um, so why didn't they take it? Well, I think one reason is this constant feeling like you could get a better deal, right? So the reason parties, part of the problem is they don't sign on because they think they can get a little better deal tomorrow. And, and they knew that Bush was out, that Obama was going to probably be coming in. Um, no, they, 2008, no, it was, they, they thought that the new change in presidency on the American side would give them more bargaining power to get an even better deal. That was one reason. A second reason was Omar at the time was, had uh, single digit popularity rates, right, after the 2006 war with Lebanon and after his corruption scandals. So he was highly unpopular and his, he was on his way out. So Abu Mazen thought, is he really gonna be able to implement this, you know, when he's gonna be out of power soon? I mean, I think he should have signed it or, you know, continued to negotiate. Personally, it was a pretty good offer actually. Um, but they're, 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 everyone looks over their shoulder and thinks they, and Netanyahu as a bargainer does this as well, you know, wants to be a tough negotiator, tries to get the best deal, and sometimes you lose the force for the trees and you don't get an agreement because you're bargaining so hard and you think you can get a slightly better deal. I forget the order of, I apologize, the order of hands. Yeah, go ahead. Hey, um, I'm right here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I didn't, he, yeah, I didn't hear that exact thing, but as I said, that doesn't surprise me. That's what I would expect, uh, that he would say for the past six years, I've been saying two years, you know, it was a political, and I think it, it was partially a political maneuver that doesn't exactly reflect his beliefs. On the other hand, it, it reflects his reluctance, right, um, or lack of urgency, right, in getting an agreement. So I think... So I think he certainly, I th the probability is, is he's not going to start having a new policy of one state solutions for some of the reasons I'll, I'll outline. Most of the Israeli population is for two states, so he wouldn't even stay in power if he constantly repeated one state. Uh, again, a third of Israelis voted for him, right? So, I, you know, I don't, I think it's likely he's going to go back from that. The problem is, is whether the international community and even the U.S. administration will believe him because they're already so skeptical of him, and that's the problem. Right, and truthfully, he has mixed feelings for sure. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. No, I think that there will be actually. I mean, I don't think it's around the corner. It might be 20 years from now, um, but I think it, it's. They were getting closer to getting it into 2013 uh, coalition. Now, you do have some problems long term with demographics in Israel, of course, because religious people have more kids than more secular people. So you have that potential obstacle as well. But many Israelis are frustrated by the kind of uh, ultra orthodox monopoly. Um, there are a lot, by the way, there are some kind of reform places. They're kind of interesting secular yeshivas now. There are a lot of Israelis who want more spirituality and are looking for other outlets. Um, I have a, on a PhD dissertation committee at MSU from an Israeli woman who's studying this. Um, so I think the majority of the public is there, uh, meaning they would like it. Um, but because of politics and coalition politics, it's never been the highest priority, and so it's been compromised on to get to higher priority issues. But I think there's so much support for it that we'll probably, my guess is, see it someday. Um, and that's extremely important. That being said, I don't think that the gender situation in Israel is that much different from the gender situation in the U.S. Uh, I really don't. I mean, I think that, uh, relatively speaking, it's very similar in that it's better to be a woman in America or Israel than most of the world. However, there's a lot of progress to be made in both countries. If you look at rates of women in Congress versus women in Knesset, it's been often pretty similar. Now there's actually more women in this new election that were elected yesterday. Israel, of course, had three parties in the past few years um, chaired by women. 
Israel had a woman prime minister. So I mean, I actually think sometimes, even with uh, my students, there's kind of a looking down uh, in terms of gender issues versus a uh, feeling like America's superior. I don't see it in terms of things being better for women in the US than they are in Israel. That being said, there's certain elements of a macho culture in Israel. There's certain elements of serving in the military. And although most women serve in the military in terms of having glass ceilings, you've had some women generals in the military. But of course, you don't have as many women rising. You have so many. Uh, it's so respected in Israel, right? Uh, high military achievements. And even though all women serve, they don't often achieve based on rates. And I certainly think Tzipi Livni faced sexism in the efforts to build her coalition in 2009, which is why, even though she won the most votes, she wasn't able to form a coalition. That being said, I don't think it's any worse than America. That means relatively good compared to most of the world, but a long way to go. <laughs> so, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think it's a, it's a good question. I think he largely is. Of course, it, 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 it depends how you define friend. The reason, well, yeah, that's with everything. I'm, uh, <laughs> I'll parcel out the words, right? I think he largely is because I think he truly, my sense is he truly has genuine empathy for Israel and for Palestinian desires for a state, but that he has genuine empathy for Israel. Um, I don't think that uh, that he doesn't, right? Um, uh, I, you know, he did go before he was elected. I don't know if you recall to Sterot and say, if my, if I was living here and my daughters were living here, I'd want to defend them, right? Um, and I think to to a large degree, he he has empathy for Israel, and he said a million times that the U.S. has an unbreakable and unshakable relationship with Israel that the US, whenever it comes down to Israeli security, will have Israel's back. And as we know, he uh, has increased, not decreased, military. Now, many of it was commit previously committed. Nevertheless, I think in, as you'd say in Israel, tachles, right, in Hebrew, the bottom line is, uh, if you look at even the behavior itself, show me the money, where the money is, uh, where the empathy is, he's done it, right? Um, and he. That being said, I don't think he's been perfect by any uh, stretch of the imagination. Why? I mean, I think he should have visited Israel before he did. And was it March 2013 when he um, finally visited? I mean, here I think it is a little problematic that he visits Turkey, he visits Saudi Arabia, he visits um, you know, uh, Egypt. And come on, our strongest ally that's a democracy, he doesn't visit. And part of it is that he was possibly uh, wanting to show some little distance from Israel in trying to gain greater popularity for the US and the region. Um, and I think his, I'm glad he finally came to Israel, but it was belated, right? Um, and I think that he would have had more influence uh, and you'd have, you know, here again, Israelis adored Clinton, and they're far from adoring Netanyahu, uh, Obama, and it's partly Obama's fault, right? He hasn't reached out enough to the Israeli public. He belated, visited, visited Israel, et cetera. And quite frankly, I think he is aware of himself of some of the mistakes that he made in trying to push a peace agreement, right? Uh, and one of them, I think he realizes, that even though um, I personally believe he believes that the settlements outside the main blocks are an obstacle to a peace agreement and to achieving a two-state solution, he emphasized that so much, uh, a part as a condition for negotiations almost, he didn't technically say it's a condition for negotiations, but he emphasized it so much that he almost pushed the PA into that position for the first time in their history. And there, you know, you lost the for you know the force for the cheese in that respect. So that if you have simultaneous negotiations with a freeze, you have more incentive to freeze. But if you freeze without having uh, negotiations and other things, so I don't think, I mean, I think he was well intentioned, but it ended up having negative results, and I think he himself realizes it. Now, what I would hope he would do. Um, and I think what's more important than the rhetoric he uses or if he talks about how much he loves Israel or what have you, is actually planning a summit 
uh, and trying to urgently to rekindle negotiations. Uh, and maybe do what Carter did with Egypt and Israel, and uh, 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 where he locks them up almost, and doesn't they don't leave until they're done. And uh, the Palestinians, Israelis aren't going to be able to do it on their own. And he can take the Clinton formula and work from it. And he needs to have his own peace proposal. Um, so I think that there are things he can do. Um, and you know, I think, you know looking at Netanyahu and Obama's personal relationship, which I think is very different from how he feels about Israel, because Bill Clinton hated Netanyahu and had an awful relationship with Netanyahu, and Israelis adored him, and he loved uh, Rabin and loved Barack. So you can't say that because someone doesn't like Netanyahu that they don't like Israel, right? That being said, you could look at both of them as having contributed to greater tensions. Both of them have said nasty things in public when they should have kept it in private. And I think, you know, not to say when two kids fight, but both of them have contributed and exacerbated this public, you know, a negative relationship that they have. So there's certain things he definitely could have done better. But I think, you know, if the bottom line question is, does he support Israel? I think he does. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, and I think that is potentially um, raises eyebrows and could change things. On the other hand, on the other hand, if you look at Tom Friedman's article this morning, Pophead this morning, New York Times, if you look at what J Street is saying, or Americans for Peace Now is saying, if you look at what CP Livni is saying, there's certainly a, some contingent of Israel supporters that are at the point of putting more pressure on Israel to try to reach or make more further progress towards a two-state solution. Now, the irony is Barack was smart enough, and he knew, I think, he had made lots of mistakes, and there's a whole psychology to him, and he has low emotional intelligence like Netanyahu, and we could get into that. But he was smart enough to say, I don't know if Arafat is a genuine part or will sign an agreement, but I'll move as far as I can to show the world that Israel has made done everything they can, and then the world will see that it's not primarily our fault, it's primarily on the other side. Now, he made mistakes himself, but he had the smarts where Netanyahu, the whole world is blaming, most of the world is blaming Israel, right, for the lack of progress in negotiations. Um, and partially because of the settlements and other things, right? But if, but if Netanyahu made it clear her, you know, rather than say kind of I give up because I don't trust the other side, kind of doing, showing the world everything and then putting it in the other bulk, then people would be emphasizing Hamas and the unity, unity government. And then, you know, I would hope that there actually would be peace, but if there wasn't, the blame would not be primarily on Israel, it would be primarily on the PA. And, and that's part of the, the problem, right? So you can argue whether Obama's right or Obama's wrong, and, and uh, you know, on one hand, it's crazy to treat your strongest ally, the, one of the only democracies and the strongest democracy in the Middle East that way. On the other hand, you know, there's constant questioning, okay, well, how are we gonna get to a two-state solution before time is running out for a one-state solution? And I think that that's a genuine concern as well. Yeah, okay, this gentleman over here and then this lady over here, yeah. Yeah, um, the, the, oh, oh, sorry, uh, the question was, you know, what is the status of the Palestinian Authority and perhaps its strength or something like that because it, whether it would continue to exist, partially because it's in such financial trouble because Israel was withholding taxes that usually provide that go to workers and um, civil servants and the Palestinian Authority and other things because they're uh, formally in a unity uh, government, even though it doesn't mean a whole lot because they haven't agreed to a whole lot with Hamas, right? Um, so that's the question. And I think this is another stark difference, by the way, in my opinion, between the right block and left block in Israel, right? The, the right block 
is more tends to see, to suspect the PA, right? And therefore not have a problem with also punishing and weakening it, right? Because therefore you're, you're really weakening not a partner to peace, but an enemy, right? Versus the center left tends to think, you know, this is still a real partner for peace. So even though you have very good reason to find it problematic to have Hamas in a unity government, you're undermining your own interests if you weaken, right, uh, the PA too much, because what'll happen, uh, they will dismantle, they will break, do uh, break down, there won't be this excellent security cooperation between the PA and Israel, and they'll, you'll relatively strengthen Hamas whenever you relatively weaken the PA and Fatah, right? So there are very different outlooks, um, and, uh, and you have to weigh the costs and benefits of it, right? But um, someone like uh, um, Halevi, who used to head the Mossad, who I've interviewed, I, a lot. He, for instance, sees the, the danger. Rabin and Barak thought it was dangerous to weaken the Fatah leader too much um, because then you're undermining your own interests and you're undermining the relative moderates. Now, I can see Netanyahu's problem with, with the unity government with Hamas, but the question is what's the alternative and what's worse, right? And so certainly uh, the PA is is not in a strong position. They haven't been elections in years. Um, it's financially unstable. It hasn't been able to deliver, you know, uh, that much lately. So it's problematic that it's in cahoots with Hamas, but it's also not, I mean, if you look at the unity deal with Hamas, they haven't really been able to cooperate at all. They're still imprisoning and torturing their respective peoples and respective prison, prisons. Um, they haven't been able to agree on when there's going to be new elections. They're not really friends, so to speak, still, even though they're formally in this unity government. Uh, I think you were next. Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, now, now I'm going to lose some of you, right? If it wasn't clear already. So now I'm already going to alienate. I was trying to be diplomatic and academic and balanced and you know um I, I i was hoping for herzog to be elected um i um uh, and not that i think that not that i uh, american president america for israel is that what you're saying i mean i i guess well a i would say you know like most americans and most jewish americans that's not necessarily going to be their number one factor in an election, right? I mean, surveys show that for most of us, um, most Jewish Americans support Israel, but for most it's not, right? Look, if you look at the initial election, 78% voted for Obama, I did. You look at the second election, 72% of Jewish Americans voted for Obama, I did. Um, um, but it wasn't necessarily for the 78% of people who did the first time and the 72% of people who voted the second time. Israel wasn't the main reason. There are a lot of other issues that divide Democrats and Republicans in American politics on which people are voting, right? So that's A. Now, if you say, okay, take away all the other issues and only look at what's good for Israel, well... I don't know. I mean, uh, what, if, what, what, where, what is the, you know, are you, who are the two people we're looking at? Uh, Obama or McCain, Obama or Romney or uh, Clinton or, right, the next person is going to be Clinton, hopefully, in my opinion. What, so uh, Hillary Clinton, no, so I, <laughs> some people are like, oh, no. Right, um, I, don't, I don't even know who the main Republican candidate would be at this point, so it's hard even to say we don't even know, do you know who it is? I don't, I don't even know who, what, so we don't even know who the alternative is. So I don't think automatically a Republican, okay, the bottom line is I don't think automatically just on the Israel issue, a Republican or a Democrat is necessarily going to be better for Israel because they're a Republican or because they're a Democrat, right? It depends on who the Democrat is and who the Republican is. Uh, right? I mean, Bill Clinton, he was great for Israel, right? He was a Democrat. I mean, so it depends on, the, I, I would think, it depends on the person, right? And we don't know who the Republican person is. We know who Clint, Hillary Clinton is, and I would be pretty comfortable with her in terms of Israel. Um, I don't know what you guys think, but um, she certainly, in terms of appearances, for those people who are concerned that maybe Obama doesn't like Israel enough, 
She certainly, at least uh, rhetorically, uh, and perhaps because of political reasons when she was senator in New York, but she certainly seems to often be even more forthcoming and expressing warmth towards Israel and Israelis. Um, now, does she like Netanyahu? She doesn't like Netanyahu, no, right? I mean, so, so part of it is, it, part of it, if you just look at the harmony of U.S.-Israeli relations, right, it's better to have a Republican in the White House and a Likudnik in Israel, right, or a Democrat in the White House and someone of the Labor Party or labor light Party in Israel, right? When you have those two things, right, Sharon and, and Bush had a good relationship. You know, um, Clinton and Rabin and Barak had a good relationship, right? So if you have Democrat and Labor or Republican and Likud, there seems to be more ideological harmony on other issues and how you look at issues and how you look at the world, et cetera, right? In some ways, although there, you can't say that either, right? So, so that's one thing. But because there's more harmony between the leaders, does that mean it's better for Israel? No, if you, that, that depends. And I think it's better for Israel to be loved and given a lot of aid to, because if it's urgent security needs, but to be pressured to urgently pursue peace negotiations and depending on the tactic, therefore freeze settlements outside of the settlement blocks, which is what Herzog said he would do, you know, so. Um, I, f I don't know if I promised any kind of order. Yeah, Alan. Yeah. Um, if you take it anything done, if, if your government doesn't win. Mm -hmm. I remember 20 or 30 years ago, uh, Labor or Likud would get into the 40s. And now, you know, that, uh, Likud got 30 seats. I mean, that's, that's much, much less. And again, I guess my question is, I mean, you mentioned the Israel Democracy Institute. And I wonder if they're working on ways to strengthen the stability of, of Israeli government. This government lasted two years, and Netanyahu had to fire a couple of his ministers. In this current constellation after the, after the election, will he have more control to maintain a longer coalition? I mean, it's from 2009, he made it last for four years. Yeah. I don't know what happened in the last two years. It's an open question whether you'll have more control in this coalition than the 2013 coalition. On, on one hand, he has less people giving him problems from the center, besides, you know, the Kulanu, the new uh, Kulanu party. On the other hand, as I said, he may not have a large coalition, and there are tensions among his coalition members on budget issues, which is one of the reasons he was calling for elections in the first place. So it's kind of an open question whether it's going to be better or worse for him. I think in a, uh, a large spectrum, it continues to be unstable, as you say. So on one hand, I always tell my students, so Israel is in many ways more democratic than the U.S., right, because there's 20 parties to choose from, and the U.S. system, um, if your party doesn't win, you're shut out for the next four years, right? And most of the cabinet uh, ministers and secretaries are of the party that won. You're basically shut out for four years, much less if you want to be part of some other Green Party, or maybe the African Americans get taken for granted by the Democratic Party. Maybe if there were more identity parties like in Israel, they could actually press for their interests more. I mean, in many ways, Israel is in those was more democratic than the US. On the other hand, there's these real costs to stability and there's the continual uh, effort to try to deal with that. One effort was to increase the voting threshold, which maybe should be increased even further. Uh, Reuven Rivlin, the new uh, president, really wants to have a reform where you could, um, essentially whoever won the most votes would automatically become prime minister, and somehow that might make things more stable rather than it is now. There's so many formulas and so many creative options, and I think there'll be a continual experimentation. But as you remember, the last time there was an experiment to separate the vote for the prime minister for the vote for parliament in the effort to strengthen the prime minister, it had the opposite effect, and therefore it had to be abandoned, because people voted for who they wanted for the prime minister, and then voted for a different party than the prime ministers based on identity politics for the parliament, and ended up having less votes for the prime minister's party, and they were disempowered by it. So there's continual thinking how to make it more stable, um, and hopefully they'll find formulas to make it more stable, but that's one of the reasons why you need more US action in terms of you know getting things done, because it's so hard. 
Yes. <laughs> Last fall, there was discussion about changing the basic law mm -hmm. and rights of, of the Arabic population, et cetera. And I think that played at least some part in the dissolution of the, of the government. Um, now that the, the new government is presumably mm -hmm. more homogeneous, um, is that going to go through? Um, I... I think probably not, um, but there might be greater efforts again to do it. I mean, the reason why it wouldn't is you still need um, the necessary votes in the Knesset as a whole, which have, as I started out saying, shifted as a whole. So I don't know if you're gonna have necessary more progress on that A. B, as I, uh, as I indicated, Reuven Rivlin is very concerned about the deterioration. He's a Likud uh, party person, but he is very concerned about the deterioration of democracy uh, in Israel away from uh, a hybrid that has more liberal democracy and away from and anything that would increase tension with Palestinian Israelis. So that those things he's actually been very outspoken about. Um, and so uh, he would be a, break on certain things, certainly the high court could be. So it's always, I mean, I think it'll continually to be raised on the agenda, um, but I don't necessarily think it's going to pass, or if it does, it'll be struck down by the high court, perhaps, as a lot of these types of things are. Yeah, that was really fascinating. Um, so Palestinian Israelis, as you probably know, there are different terms that are used. Often Arab Israelis are used. Um, uh, the reason I use Palestinian Israelis is because I think a lot of Palestinian Israelis identified. It's kind of interesting. Polls show that their affiliation with Israel has risen over years, and their uh, affiliation with Palestinian nationality and identity has risen over years, and both have risen simultaneously. And so because a lot of them at times want to be referred as Palestinian Israelis, I think people, we should take on the definitions of what people want to be called, whether it's African Americans or Palestinian Israelis, or as that changes, people should evolve to do. Now, I, again, you often hear Arab Israelis. Now, what's interesting there is maybe it, it can be a more useful term, because as we know, there are also Druze Israelis and others that aren't Palestinian, don't consider themselves Palestinian. So um, therefore, should we differentiate Druze Israelis? Well, not anymore. I mean, I don't think any. Well, I think most Jewish Israelis don't refer to themselves as Palestinians. Maybe before Israel was created, they do. No, I understand what you're saying in terms of the history of what can be called. And it, you, before the state was established, you'd have Palestinian Jews who, because they lived in Palestine, would call themselves Palestinian Jews. I think very, very few. Jews in Israel today refer to themselves to Jewish Israelis. So maybe your, was it your sister is one of the few, I think, um, who does. So but that's, it's an interesting discussion. And it's interesting in terms of the Druze to see that, I don't know if you knew that uh, the Druze leaders in Lebanon were telling the Druze leaders in Israel to vote with the Arab Israelis, Palestinian Israelis in their united front. And they came out saying, don't tell us what to do. Um, and they voted primarily, as they always do, for Zionist parties, because of course they serve in the Israeli military. And the sixth person uh, that um, uh, uh, Lieberman's party uh, just got is a Druze a member who was in the Knesset, I think, three times now. He, it's funny, he's in the Russian you know, uh, party, so the Drew, Druze are all over the place in terms of Zionist parties. Um, and he's, by the way, a, a fifth belt martial artist, black belt martial artist, and kind of is an interesting guy and does all these youth groups for, for the Druze. But so, so anyway, so yeah, it's kind of an interesting question. Should you call them Arab Israelis, Palestinian Israelis? And I think you see both of those terms. Is there any? Okay, one more question. Oh, yes, sorry about that. Yeah, that's interesting. So Meretz, as you say, the leftmost Zionist party, um, headed by a woman, uh, um, uh, just got their fifth seat from soldiers voting. 
which is interesting, right? Because often I think, at least in, you know, on campus, you find people often associating military with right wing. You know, but of course, it doesn't work. Often it's, it's just not correct to do that. And I actually have the experience where I'm trying to bring in visiting Israeli scholars on campus, and I had a couple of colleagues not tell me, tell somebody else, essentially we don't want them because they served in the IDF, right? Which is ridiculous. It's basically saying like we don't want an Israeli because all Israelis serve. Anyway, that's a different story. But the, the expectation is, oh, if it's military, it's going to be right wing. And of course it indicates that many in the military aren't. And then, of course, you get the Likud. So I think that's you know, kind of an interesting phenomena as to who's voting, what the military was. And I think it used to be that the constituency of the American military used to be Democrat. Now more soldiers are Republican, I think, in America. Although if you look at the Pentagon's leadership, there was a mentor of mine at Columbia who did a study on this. Is the Pentagon any more likely than the State Department or any other department to advocate war? And they're not, you know, in, in lots of historical situations. So it's, anyway, it's interesting how we stereotype Type the military, and, and um, certainly that that feeds into that. It's one last question. I could talk about Israeli politics all night. This is I, I love it. So. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I think that um, the common Israeli view is that Iran is a very grave uh, threat to Israel, uh, if not the biggest um, security threat to Israel, uh, partially because threat assessments are partially intentions and capacity. It certainly has an intention that it repeatedly calls for of destroying Israel, uh, and it has great capacity, which, and it has killed Israelis through its proxies of Hezbollah and Hamas over many years, um, and, um, Etc. Right. So it's it's and certainly if it became nuclear, that magnifies the repercussions in terms of whether they would be emboldened and strengthen Hamas and Hezbollah at a minimum, and they would have even more sophisticated rockets, and Israel would be threatened by that as a minimum or as a maximum. You have a well that the maximum, but the other probability would be you have a nuclear arms race. So most Israelis see it as a grave threat and see it as a greater threat than most Americans. Right. Most Americans see Iran as a threat. We've been enemies for 30, you know, more than 30 years, right? But Israel, because of its proximity and because of Iran's essentially killing Israelis through its proxies and rhetoric of trying to annihilate uh, Israel, is seen as a graver threat than by most Americans. Now that being said, it's then very interesting where you go from there, right? So it's interesting, most Israelis though in polls show that they don't want Israel acting militarily unilaterally against Iran without at least working with the US or having a green light from the US, right? So, so on one hand, they see a grave uh, threat from Iran. On the other hand, they're not itching necessarily to have a military strike. And they're, um, you know, they don't wanna sacrifice the alliance with the US or harm the alliance with the US, right? And then, as you probably know, within the Israeli government, there is hot debate. There's agreement Israel is a grave threat. There's a disagreement um, whether you should allow negotiations to continue, how long you should negotiate, how long you have to negotiate, and whether Iran, even though it is a grave threat, is an existential threat or not, right? So Netanyahu thinks it's an existential threat, right? and apparently was close in the past to seriously considering military strikes, as was perhaps Barack. On the other hand, the former heads of the Mossad and the Shin Bet and some high military officers say, yes, Iran is a grave threat, but it's not an existential threat, and we should continue negotiations and allow for more negotiations, et cetera, right? So there's agreement on a lot of things, but there's also more disagreement within the government than that perhaps is often recognize, right? And so that's kind of an interesting issue as well that maybe feeds into debates in the United States as well as to how long to negotiate, what negotiating terms would be, et cetera. You know, is that? All right, well, I'm happy to stick around if you have more questions, and I really appreciate the discussion.